Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this week's uh, seminar. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'll just mention the next few uh, seminars that we have. Uh, next week, we're not going to have a seminar. There's been a, ca a cancellation of the speaker. So uh, no, no talk by Amy Dickman uh, ne ne next week. And we'll have, that like, we'll have it sometime next time, I'm sure. Uh, then the week after, we've got uh, Edith Hammer from Lund University on soil ecology from the microbes I view. Um, that's on the 8th of March. And then the following week on the 15th, we've got Jerome Lewis from uh, UCL on build, building collaborations with indigenous and local communities using extreme citizen science. Uh, so uh, uh, do, and then we've got more things coming come after that, but do, do, do come along to, to either of those. While I'm mentioning seminars next week, for those of you here in Oxford, uh, next Wednesday, there is a talk by John Schellenhuber at the Natural History Museum at 4 p.m. on how to survive the Anthropocene, flat overshoot or deep restoration. So some of you may want to come along to that one in the, in the Natural History Museum uh, uh, as well. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, to today's speaker, just uh, trying to go to Wikipedia to introduce you. Uh, and, uh, don't. Okay, don't. so I had an interesting lunch with, with Tim. So Tim has an interesting uh, career, starting off as an archaeologist before working as a songwriter and producer in the 80s, for which he received seven platinum and gold discs. Uh, and then in 87, he moved with his family to Cornwall and became uh, involved and started the Lost Gardens of Heligan in Cornwall. And then in the uh, 90s, he started the Eden Project. Yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more about this. There's an image of it, I think, that was earlier on there in Cornwall, and which has become iconic in both as a center for understanding, connecting with, with nature, but also in terms of local uh, regeneration and economic regeneration of an area. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Uh, and more recently, Eden has been expanding out of that, that Cornwall hub to, to uh, uh, areas in the north of England and, and in Scotland and others uh, as well. And Tim has just come back on his way back from Morecambe, where uh, he was uh, discussing some 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 of these these issues there. And he was made a a, a CBE and then a, and a, a, he was knighted in two thousand and eleven. There's many other things we could talk about, but uh, uh, thank you for joining us, Tim. Over to you. It, it's a great pleasure. Hello, everybody. Um, I I'm going to be a huge disappointment to you. Because if, if, if you've come expecting deep science, you should leave now. Um, the subject of my conversation, which is what it will be, uh, is about my hobby of kissing frogs, which is that I think the greatest, the greatest pleasure I know is taking something and transforming it from being apparently hopeless into something really hopeful. And I hope during the course of my chat, I will tell you about some of the things I'm working on we have projects, uh, as Edwin just said, we got, uh, we're got we about to start building an Eden project, a very different Eden project. I ought to say that at my huge age, I am a really old fart, I'm 69, and I promised myself at the age of 50, I was never going to do the same thing twice, because why would you, you know, and it's, it, but so each Eden, although it has the name Eden attached to it, is, if you like, uh, an evolved form of what we did before, uh, moving somewhere else and I, I feel very privileged that I've lived through a period uh, all of you being young uh, you know I uh, you will not see it as going through a massive change but the siloing of the way of people think uh, which is dying all around us which is a really really good thing means that for example an Eden project imagined say in 1990 is almost irredeemably old-fashioned when you now look at the way we're thinking about um uh, life and the interrelationships between all life forms being con concentrating in a sense, sense on a botanic collection or whatever feels a rather primitive and unsophisticated way of going. Bear in mind when I was young, when I was young um, and I had really long hair, hard as that is to believe, and there was a musical called Hair in 1969 and so I wasn't making any link between the word hair and my state now. Um, uh, and for those of you who don't know, which is the majority, the theme song of hair was We Are Stardust, um, which was a play on words um, on Carl Sagan's phrase, uh, uh, we are all made of star stuff. Um, isn't it amazing that what was considered, if you excuse my Greek, hippie shit in 1969 
has in the space from 1969 to now become established science in the sense that um, if you if if you start in process of the understanding, well, understanding the discovery and the evolution of an understanding into um, uh, you know, the microbiome of the human, and then over the last um, four or five years, uh, the revelation of the uh, communicative, I'm not sure what the correct word is, but how the world of mycelium and fungus uh, is so much bigger than we ever thought. Did you know, by the way, there are 3,000 times more fungus, mycelium, in the ocean than there are on land? I learned that last week. I mean, that's just crackers, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. I'm going to interrupt my speech and tell you something else, which is really, I mean, I've had probably the most astonishing month of my entire life. I've been privileged to go and see things which just made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. You know, I spent um, three days in Woods Hole in uh, Massachusetts in their marine laboratories with young scientists, people of your age, who don't want the constraints of the past and they want to experiment. I went into a lab where there were these guys working with skate. Yeah, they were working with skate and mycelium in the same place. And it was great because one of my best friends is a guy called Merlin Sheldrake who wrote um, a book on fungi, which you may have seen in Tangled Life. It's a great book. Um, and um, so the moment I said, I'm a friend of Merlin Sheldrake. They wanted to open up every cupboard they have and show me everything they had. But there they were working. There was one group of people working on um, on, on these skate. There must have been 5,000 skate in this enormous tank, right? And they were looking at skate because of sports injuries. Skate are, as you know, I'm telling you what you already know, but it's really pleasing because then you feel clever, okay? Um, uh, skate are cart what are called cartilaginous fish. And their cartilage grows in a really unusual way. And what they'd done is they'd done the, um, do correct me as we go, uh, they'd done the, 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 the gene testing on the skate and were trying to create, if you like, it to me as a pagan, a sort of almost tracing paper overlay to go over the human genome to see where the various things that were affecting the cartilage growth would overlap with certain things in the human genome. I was just I was, for an ignoramus like me, I was just going, wow, that's me. And then then I went into another room, get this. And there are thousands of horseshoe crabs. Yeah, big horseshoe crabs. And there's a rig with maybe a hundred crabs that have had underneath their tails slit and they're bleeding like stuck pigs. And there are all these vats, they're sucking blood out of the horseshoe crabs. I said, what are you doing that for? And they said, $3,000 a pint. You see, it was worth coming already, wasn't it? You've heard something you didn't know. You can now go to the pub over the weekend and say, I met a guy who actually saw people cutting horseshoe crab tails, bleeding them and selling it for all that money for a pint because it's 300 million year old blood. What I mean is, you know, in terms of its, it, it, its origin. And they sell it to blood testing places all over the world to find a whole range of conditions that I can't tell. We've reached the limit of my knowledge. I think you're getting it. But I, I, what I want to explain to you is the excitement of seeing young people going bananas, studying, thinking, working across systems. And you've got this real buzz of a sense of, it's a cliche, that phrase skunk works, you know, which came out of the Lockheed Martin work in the 60s. But, but this sense that the quest was the thing that was important. It, was the, it wasn't simply linear process. It was a frontier to be crossed. Fantastic. And then I went into the other, the last room I've got to describe. I haven't even started my talk yet, right? But the, but the last room, you will not believe. There were several thousand axolotls, right? Yeah. You haven't heard that sentence before, have you? No. no well, for those of you unfamiliar with an axolotl, it's got, it's like, it's a, a sort of albino looking salamander, fellow my lad, with pink gills. It's, it's a, an immature it's an immature salamander, which if you do something to it, and I forget what it is, and you put it somewhere else, it will then turn into something else completely. But these salamanders, guess how weird this was. They were in these flat, um, you can't even call them aquaria. They were like only this tall because they can't climb. They can't climb. Well, they certainly couldn't climb because they had their, their legs cut off. 
You see, I'm shocking you already. No, but this is astonishing. They had got the legs of these salamanders, which they chopped off, and they had put them on... It wasn't blotting paper, but it looked like blotting paper with some liquid that permeated and kept the whole thing moist. And the, the woman who was in charge of the experiment, she said, look at this. And she brought this really big magnifying glass and put it down over, over the axolotls. I've never seen anything like it. From the shoulder, the cut shoulder of the axolotl, these fibers were growing out. From the cut off arm, that wasn't even part of the main body were fibers moving towards the fibers coming out the shoulder. How astonishing is that? And then they went to the little foot and the same. Same principle as I was telling you about the skate, but they were working there. They, they, they felt they were within a measurable period of time. I mean, serious researchers don't say we're within three months or whatever but they felt that they were within touching distance of breaking the secret of, we've all known, haven't we, that it's really weird that a lot of the crab fishermen, they rip the claws off and then throw the cab back. And then six weeks later, eight weeks later, the crab's got a new claw. The same you've always known about lizards, haven't you? You, you can try and catch a lizard as a kid and suddenly you're left with a tail and the lizard's buggered off. But this, so we, everybody's known there's something in there that if humans could somehow work out how that happened to regrow. It could be fundamental. I mean, there's something like 30 million people in the world. I'm not making the figure out. Someone told me 30 million people in the world whose backbones have been uh, snapped or they can't work in some particular way. And that's what all this is about, to see whether you can repair the human body by knowing which switches to, to pull. As you, as you will have noticed, there's not a single jot of science in what I'm saying. Because that's not the point. I'm just trying to get you excited for the journey. You can do the science. There are lots of wizard people. You're, actually, you're in Oxford, you may have realised. There's some quite clever people. But the point is to remind us that life is utterly thrilling. And if you were to ask me, quite honestly, I don't think there has ever been a more exciting time to be alive than now. As all of these forces that we've been talking about in terms of the mycelium, in terms of the the microbiomes and things like that are starting to get understood. I actually feel really jealous. I was saying to my young son the other day, I think you're going to go through a period now over the next 20, 30 years where this generation is going to get religion, but not religion as we know it. It's going to be an understanding of our connection to the natural world and that we are all star stuff of some kind. And that in itself will lead to thoughts and processes being developed, which are going to be good for the planet and actually suddenly reveal a whole lot of stuff, which is really exciting. And I hope, I hope that your experience before head game for the weekend of listening to me speak, that you'll leave here feeling flipping hell. It's a really amazing time to be alive. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about that. When I tell you about my day spent with a lake of cow shit and how exciting that was, you see, you're already suspending disbelief. You never thought you'd find that exciting. By the time I finish describing a lake of cow shit and why it should excite you, you're going to go, wow. Really, you are. I did wow. I don't even know anything about cow shit. And by the time I'd finished the day with it, I felt I'd seen almost, you know, some kind of guru coming from on high. But we'll come on to that later. Um, I explained about the axolotls, the skate and the... Um, horseshoe crabs, simply because one of the other things that's happening is a breakdown in those silos uh, where those who study those things are starting to embrace things which I would never, ever have thought. So, for example, one of the, the, the cultural gods of the American young scientist is a poet, an Irish poet called David White. If none of you have read David White, he, he wrote... He's written some marvellous books, but look him up online. He writes poetry that makes even people who don't like poetry feel misty-eyed. Really. White, W-H-Y-T-E, by the way, just in case you're taking notes. Um, no, actually, Mark, what I'm trying to say is there's a cultural thing going on here to do with... Um, it's, it's almost like an act of revelation. So let us now talk about frogs. I'm going to tell you at a speed which, if there's anybody who's hard of hearing, I'm really sorry. I'm going to tell you my life story so quickly so I can then go on to ideas. 
All right. I was born. That's a start. Boof. I went to a university. And when I got to university, I um, was poor. And I noticed a rock band that came to play for the May Hops was paid a lot of money. So I decided because I played the piano, I had to have a rock band so I could earn money as a May ball. I formed a rock band. I became an archaeologist. I then after I had become an archaeologist, I got even poorer. So I decided that London must be paved with roads of gold. So I went to London and was immediately unemployed because when you get to London, you discover that on any night of the week, there are 30,000 musicians better than you already there. However, none of them was as cunning as me. And on one of my first weekends in London, I went down to Clapham Common to play football. There was a scratch team of people in the entertainment business. And I hacked somebody down very bad tackle it was and I was really mortified at what I'd done and someone said do you know who you've just nearly crippled and I said no and they said that's Pat Stapley he's the lead sound engineer at Abbey Road Studios so I went hello <laughs> and so anyway Pat and I would become firm friends but he he then let me record at Abbey Road for free and we were really lucky because we got record deal after record deal. we didn't have any hits we had record deal after record deal after record deal um, so we were able to pay our way and that gave us kind of a credibility with the studio. And now many of you will find this impossible. There was once a period of time when there was no such thing as a mobile phone. My greatest success occurred because the very first night I had taken my wife out to dinner after we'd had our first child, we needed a babysitter. And I asked my sister in law to come and babysit. And she said, could you bring a friend? She brought a friend at the end of the evening the friend said, I understand you're in the music business. I'm an opera singer. Would you like my card? Inside, I was saying, I hate opera. I'd never, I'd, I'd actually cross the road to not hear opera. But I put it in my top pocket, right, card. And the following day, I go to Abbey Road. And the singer that was supposed to be singing for us phones in ill. So I, I only had two other phone numbers. And they, they, but in those days, of course, people weren't just sitting at home by the phone hoping it would ring. So they were all out. And then I reached for the card. And I phoned this lady and she came. And four weeks later, the record, she'd, the record she'd sung on went to number one in Belgium, then number one in Holland, then all across Scandinavia, then Germany. And then it became the biggest selling record in French history. The album went platinum, went uh, top 10 in America, all because a woman I had met for no longer than five minutes just happened to be free and gave me a card. Magic. Believe me, magic comes through being open to the unexpected. One of the other themes of what I'm going to be talking about is when parents send their children to a posh school or here to posh university, well, of course, you got here on your own steam, but the idea behind it is my loved child will meet people, will meet people, and this will make their career go forward and the rest of it. And the thing I would say is that is so old fashioned because I think. Most of the people I know, and I know a lot of people, the magic of their life has been in meeting the people they didn't know they needed to meet. It wasn't organized like that. Meeting people you don't know you need to meet is a very interesting thing. I'll give you an example of two things that have changed my life through accepting. I, I've forgotten to tell you. The main mantra of my life is that I accept every third invitation I receive. I do. It doesn't mean I don't accept the first, but I accept the third. If you're as smart as you think you are, you will make a note to yourself. That single sentence is worth a life. And the reason for it is this. There's a wonderful book by David Eagleman called Sum, S-U-M, which is the single best short book I have ever read in my life. And I'm not alone in that. 42 visions of paradise it is absolutely hilarious but it starts it starts with imagine you have to die you know you have to die but you can plan it you're going to have you're going to be in heaven with your good friends and your family and you're going to be all together it's going to be great and then it finishes by saying now imagine eternity <laughs> well people of my age when you talk to them about this you say come on let's be honest all those 
afternoons and nights you've used up over your life with your old friends, the mates you made at school and university, bathing in that wonderful, soft, romantic haze that you make your best friends at school and at university, and the life you have wasted remaining with total bores that you have pasted over by trying to pretend they're interesting, making allowances for them, laughing at the same jokes. I've just told you the truth. It really is the truth. Um, I didn't say all your friends were like that, by the way, just in case, <laughs> you know. So, okay, I was invited, third invitation, to go and talk in a Nissan hut. It's an old military hut uh, near Taunton in Somerset. I, I was told there would be 50 people and a dog. And my PA went bonkers. She said, that's 170 miles. You're going to drive to talk to a few people and a, and a dog. And you've got to be in London the following day. And um, anyway, I couldn't help myself. I had to go. I went, I spoke, and indeed there were 50 people. And the dog loved it, by the way. dog was very happy. And the talk went well. Three months later, I am in a horrible building in Plymouth for a meeting of European commissioners who are in charge of something called the EU ERDF 5B Secretariat. You're impressed by that, aren't you? I mean, you're impressed. I even remembered that. But it was, it was actually burnt into my soul. It was the time when they were dishing out money to the five counties of the Southwest, which were relatively impoverished, to various projects in each of the counties. We discovered early on we were going to get nothing because Cornwall was behaving really badly. They decided there was a risk that if they gave the Eden Project money, the money for the new part of Exeter University going to Cornwall might be threatened. Therefore, everybody battened down the hatches. And suddenly our friends in Cornwall so we're really sorry, Tim, but we've we've been put under a three-line whip, you know. So I was looking at the end of the Eden Project, the end of it. Then this old guy gets up. Everybody's silent and they just look up at him and he says, my name is Humphrey Templey and I am the chairman of Somerset County Council. And just three months ago, I saw this man come out to Somerset because he believes that we're part of the wider West Country and he spoke to us for an hour and a half. And I've just spoken to my colleagues and we've decided to drop one of our projects. If each of you will drop one each, this is obviously a project that's good for all of us. Collapse of Stout Party, they all went unanimous. That talk to the, the dog and the 50 people was worth 12.7 million pounds. <laughs> and it happens every time. I know you will think I can't be doing with the stress of ending up being a judge of the West of England ballroom dancing championships and you don't know anything about ballroom dancing. I've done all that stuff. I've opened old people's homes. I've judged dog shows. I've judged the worst, the most dangerous thing that you must never do, even if it's the third invitation. I said that there are no exceptions. There are. Do not judge orchid shows. <laughs> no, no. No, because what you forget is that for every person that adores you for your good taste, there's now 100 people would like to have your entrails put up on the front door. No, it's a very risky, risky business. So where was I? Oh, yes, yes. So I um, I had this, this hit record and everything, and I, I, I ended up in a limousine one night, um, and this limousine was uh, taking me um, to the Tour d'Argent, where I was going to pick up a whole bunch of gold records. Um, and um, the driver put on the radio, and it was my song. That felt pretty cool. And then the second song that came on was a record I'd written for another French singer that was soon going to knock my record off number one and go to number one itself. How cool is that? I was made up. And I started to cry. And I never went to the Tour d'Argent. You know, it is a really weird thing when you think you want something to the bottom of your being and you get it and it feels like ashes going through your fingers. It's really funny when you fake up the notion of your self-image through the success or perceived success was supposed to compensate for something I don't know what, but it, it was totally not doing that. And it was actually, it felt so tragic having it and then not feeling everything you thought. 
So I decided that I was going to change my life and I've changed my life very radically. I decided I was going to work my life by not only accepting the third invitation, which I was already doing, but I was um, uh, I was going to just uh, chase my instincts. Because the one thing I'd learned from the music industry, which you can all relate to, I'm sure, is that if you love something and you're not a freak, and most of us aren't, I mean, we like to joke we might, we're not, right? If you love something, there will be millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of other people who love it too. Therefore, the issue is marketing. It is. It's how do you tell people about the thing that you love and why they should like it? And it's a really interesting thing. A lot of people don't actually realize how to convey their love of something. I'm quite good at that. That's, that's pretty much what I do. You know, if someone asked me what my job was, I'd have to say, well, I'd, I'd probably have Kisser of Frogs in there, um, Exorcist. I do that. Um, and that's probably all I do. But it's fun. It's fun. So I moved to Cornwall by accident because I went on holiday. It was raining. I ducked into an estate agent. I went in to wait for the rain to stop. And there was a house for sale. I picked it up and looked at it. The guy who was the estate agent said, sir, won't like that, and took it out of my hands. And I thought, woo. I took it back on him. And anyway, the following day, it was raining as well. So I, I decided I'd go and see this house. This is crazy. This is 280 miles from where I lived in Brixton in London. I went to see this farm in the rain. And as I'm driving, this tractor crosses my path and it blocks my, 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 my way. And this guy comes out in a sou'wester and this rain streaming down his face. And I wind down the window. He says, what are you doing here, old buck? And I went, but this is really embarrassing. I understand there's a farm for sale and I just wanted to have a look at the farm house. And he said, that's my, aunt. that's my farm. Come and have a cup of tea. Anyway, two and a half hours later, I bought his house and it was just crazy. So I had to sell my house and then, and then I had to move to Cornwall. And then the terror, I'd moved to Cornwall and I had to address the issue that I was now leaving the music industry and I wasn't trained to do anything. Do you know how terrifying that is to actually know hardly anything that's useful? You know, when I'm, I'm so useless that when I look, I've got a toolbox that anybody who knows me, whenever I make any move towards it, they immediately grab it and take it away because they're just worried I'm going to devalue the property. You know, the, you know he'll put up a shelf that falls down and so on. So anyway, I moved to Cornwall. It was a money pit. I used up all my money to make this house livable and it was really good. I was now broke. I'd spent everything on this house, right? I then go to the dentist. You probably don't know where I'm going with this, do you? <laughs> I go to the dentist. What are the chances that in a de dentist surgery there is a copy of this week's The Stage? It should be last year's Country Life or something like that. But no, it was this week's The Stage. I open up the stage just waiting to have some deep canal work done or something, whatever it was. And I open it up at random, and it's a picture of the football player, Jackie Charlton, now sadly dead, holding a huge salmon, and it announced that ITV were making an enormous documentary of 10 parts about the pleasures of fishing called Go Fishing. This, ladies and gentlemen, was a sign. I need to go back. In a drunken haze some six, seven years before, I had been in my studio in Farnham in, in, in Surrey, and a friend of mine had a banjo and was playing a banjo. And we just made up a song on the spot. Unbelievably, this song, which sounded not dissimilar to that Mungo Jerry hit in the summertime, you know, the one with the banjo playing. I won't sing it for you. I don't want to clear the audience this early. But, but I found the cassette. I sent it to the TV company. They said, we want that as the theme song. And by the way, have you written any more music that we could use? We haven't chosen any music for the show. So... From a situation of abject, I had nothing, going to the dentist yielded everything. So then what happened is a guy turned up in a white van with a pig, a really big black pig. And this black pig, he told me, was going to go to slaughter if I did not take it as a pet. Well, I thought, I thought that was harsh. You know, he was giving me all the guilt. He said, I do know, because I come here quite often, that you've got a garage, but you haven't got a car good enough to go into it. 
therefore it's empty. So um, all you need to do is put a bit of fencing in front of it and the pig will have a nice home. That's how Horace came to live with me. But Horace hated the garage. And as soon as Rob, the guy who delivered him, had, 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 had driven off, I heard this grunting noise and Horace had just walked straight through his fence. And worse, was now at the back door of the farm. And with his nose, he unhinged the back door of the farmhouse and walked in and lay down next to the auger. And there he remained for a week. I'm serious. He would, I couldn't get him out. And, uh, but he, he was very good. He, I could get him out. He would go out and do a crap in the same spot and then come back because they're really clean. I knew that the only way I could get Horace out of the farmhouse was to go and find him a mate. So I found Doris. And after I found Doris, Doris and Horace, they just, they went bazookas with each other. I tell you what, the noise, it was deafening. <laughs> so, so anyway, I still didn't, you will, you're still with the story, right? You remember, I haven't got a job. I don't know what I'm doing. So Doris then gave birth at two o'clock in the morning in 1990, uh, in November, the something, I can't remember what day it was, under, under a heat lamp and lots of hay. And I knew that was a sign. I was going to start a rare breed park. I was going to find some land. I was going to get rare breed uh, domestic animals. I was going to breed them. And that was going to be my future. A week later, I go and see the man who owns the land that would have been perfect for a rare breed park. I go there. Um, he says he will see me. He instantly tells me I can't have the land, but I can't go because he's just given. I've got very sensitive lips. Right. You don't need to know that, but it, it, it's got a purpose for the story. I've got very sensitive lips. So I'm holding this really hot coffee and I know that it'd be really rude if I just put the whole cup down and walk out. So we start engaging in small talk during the course of which I just happened to mention in my dim and distant past, I had been an archaeologist. He said the immortal words that I've never heard before or since, I have need of an archaeologist. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was extraordinary. So um, I said, why is that? He said, well, I've inherited this huge estate next to where we're standing. Look, you wanting a rare beef, but all that buried up stuff there. There's a very famous garden in there, but no one's been in there for 70 years. Would you like to come with me tomorrow? Because I could use some help analyzing the plates of time. So I took on, I put on my archeologist voice as if I knew a thing or two. And the following day was rather amazed to be given a machete for a garden visit. <laughs> and we, we cut our way in. And 45 minutes later, we came to this huge brick wall, probably as tall as that. Yeah. Um, and there was a door in the middle of it. You know, this sort of classic, secret garden door painted in green paint, which is just peeling and the hinges are bleeding rust and all the rest of it, slightly ajar, shoulder inside, romance, fell in love. It's like Sleeping Beauty. And I knew then and there that I was going to restore this place. It was as well that I didn't know anything. And I, 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 the reason I'm telling you this part of the story is I knew nothing about what I was doing, except I loved it. I just loved what it was. If I'd known something, I wouldn't have dared do it. That's the problem. Most of us don't do things because we think our intelligence is telling us you can't do it. But everything I have done and been successful at, I, I didn't have a clue about because my skill was finding people who really did know about things and forgetting to tell them, the asking them the question, can we do it? I just said, if I was doing it, what would I do? And that's a very different way of approaching it. All the top horticulturists in the whole of Cornwall were in when I called. They were in. I said, could you come over to see this place? They all came over. We just had a, we got on really, really well. And I said, I think this is going to be the bestest adventure you've ever seen. And the only thing we've got to do is market it. And so I phoned up a guy I'd met socially called Stefan Buchatsky, who was a, a famous garden writer and he was at the BBC doing Gardener's World. And I phoned him up and I said, Stefan, this is a very short phone call. I'm going to give you one chance before I go to the other channel. This is the greatest garden restoration probably of the century, and I'm about to undertake it. I've got all the big people coming to do it. Are you in? He just said immediately, yes. So we were in play. So for the next year, we had a, a group from the BBC filming everything we did. It was easy to get sponsors to do various things or lend us diggers or dumper trucks or whatever it was needed. We had a huge amount. We had, at our heyday, we had over 100 volunteers. And all the time, the cameras were wheeling and 
anyway, it came out, it was a 10 part documentary came out of it. It won the uh, documentary of the year. The book that I wrote became book of the year. And we got first 100,000, then 200, then 300. And now it's nearly 400,000 visitors a year coming to it. And it's fantastic. I mean, it is really fan. I know I own it. Actually, I don't now own it because I've given it to my children. But but um, the fantastic thing is that you think, again, it's going back to me being in a limousine and crying. You think that owning it is the thing. It isn't. What is amazing is when you realize you're kind of trustee of a place. We've now had over 400 people have wanted their ashes scattered there. And I go there probably three or four times a year and I meet people who have broken in uh, in the evening and they will have set up a dining room table on our lawn and they'll be there dressed to the nines and you'll leave crying. They're there because it's the last meal they're going to have together. It's fantastic. To own a place that people believe is theirs. If I change anything, I get letters like any, nobody's business. How dare you? You know, and then we have the issue. We had the issue of the otter. Should I kill the otter? Boy, our public enemy number one. On our film screen, we managed to catch an otter. There should be no otters at Heligan at all. There's no river, right? This otter broke into the northern summer house and in plain sight of our CCTV, goes in over a period of two hours and takes every single ornamental goldfish. <laughs> it then sits on its ass right under the screen, munching very slowly, across the backbone, and then it throws the next bit away. In it comes, uh, unbelievable cheek. Anyway, it had to be dealt with. It had to be dealt with. And I told the friends of Heligan, we've got a lot of friends of Heligan, that we're going to deal with it. And they said, um, you, we can't. We'll stop coming if you do that. So you know what we did? I started something. With, I am now, in Britain, the biggest buyer of lion dung in the world. In Britain, I mean, not in the world, because um, otters really hate lion shit. If you think about it, that's pretty wacky. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of scientists in the room. OK, what's the answer? How come a creature, a whole species that has never seen a lion can tell that it should be shit scared, so to speak? You know, seeing, smelling lion shit. It works also, I have to tell you. This is, again, because I know you need to leave here pretending it was legitimate coming to hear me talk, right? <laughs> Um, I then subsequently, three years ago, bought a bankrupt golf course because I wanted to turn it into an orchard, right? So I got rid of most of the holes, keeping just a few. And the problem was we had badgers eating leather jackets and leather jackets like that little bit of soft ground just around the edge of a green. And they were just tearing the whole place up. Again, lion shit. A badger has never met a lion knowingly unless they live near a zoo, you know, maybe, but it's, it's not. but it's foolproof. Our greens have got no badger damage at all. They're scared, scared, scared. I don't know how I got onto that subject of the lion shit. Anyway, um, Heligan became what it is. And um, I learned also about the transformative nature of building a community. We have a lot of staff. We have more gardeners at Heligan than it did in the Victorian heyday. And you know how your capitalist friends who are good at business that have been to, you know, done an MBA, they always tell you labor's a big cost, you've got to deal with labor. You know, I found something really weird. The more people I employ, the better the business is. Isn't that really weird? The better cared it is, the better area, the happier it is. So um, it's very interesting. We have 24 gardeners at Heligan, which per capita is more, uh, per scale of thing is but more than um, at Eden. Um, but it's great. It's transformed. This is the whole point of my talk, by the way. I'll get round to it in a minute. But Mevagissi, which is this the town that is 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 below us, right? When we started the restoration of Heligan, Mevagissi was a tough, tough town. It was a place with a few hard drinking pubs and a chippy. Today, there's about half a dozen restaurants. All the pubs have been done up. You might say that's been gentrified, but it's not. The two factories have moved in. The fish processing places have moved into Mevagissi. There's an art gallery. The school has been done up. It's really hard to get labor there. And it's successful as a tourist destination. There's money in the place and there's the sense of a future. And that's really, really important. 
because they get an awful lot of visitors now because they come to Heligan. In the middle of all this, <coughs> I decided I wanted to do something bigger. I, I'd fallen in love with the idea of something big. And I'd been in the clay district uh, of, of China. You know, clay is degraded granite, as you know. And the spine of Cornwall, which goes right down the middle of it, is granite, which is degrading in the, all of the money. The big wealth of Cornwall has come from China clay extraction, Kalen. And um, I went up there thinking that we might do something like one of the... Um, do you remember they when, when uh, in 1984, they had the riots in Liverpool, the Toxteth riots, and they decided to... Michael Heseltine thought that the way to stop people beating each other up was to have a garden festival, which I thought was a bit left field, but anyway... <laughs> no, but to be fair, to be fair, it started a tradition which is actually quite good. And that, so every few years they would have a garden festival for which lasted for a year. They did there, they did Stockton, they did Glasgow, they did Stoke, and eventually they ended up at Ebu Vale uh, in 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 uh, Wales. And I went to see the civil servants in in Wales to find out about a garden festival and how it worked. And they were the nicest people I've ever met. They said, we completely screwed up. They told me everything they'd done wrong, everything. And the real nice thing is, nice, I don't know if it's the right word. The truth is I would have made a lot of mistakes that they made if they hadn't warned me in advance. They told me um, about uh, the biggest mistake they made was all this money came in to create this garden festival. And they were so concentrating on building something out of bricks and mortar that they hadn't concentrated on jobs, the people who'd have to operate it and work it. They hadn't thought about what they might put in the shop or what they would do for food or anything like that. So when they came to open it, they, they it literally, you're not going to believe this, three months before they opened it, suddenly occurred to them they should get those things sorted. So they had to hire staff from outside Wales, food, even their uniforms they got from outside Wales. They were so they were so embarrassed at this mistake. But I knew immediately that one of the things we needed to do if we were going to build a project was to plan. Uh, you, you just have to start by saying we are going to be successful. Right. We're going to be successful. Let's plan on success. And I, another rule I made for myself was never, ever again use the word if. Never use the word if. It's really interesting when you use the word when. It doesn't take long, three months, four months for people to start using the word when as well about the subject. And the moment a whole group of people are using the word when it becomes it is going to work, it's going to happen. Um, and each of the projects I've worked on since then, that has been the case. And um, so I, I spent a few months looking for a hole in the ground. I eventually found a hole in the ground, um, which is called Bedelva, and it's absolutely perfect. And we raised uh, 144 million pounds, uh, which everybody said couldn't be done in a place like Cornwall. What's a little guy like you doing it? It's really interesting. When you talk to civil servants, everybody says, you're so visionary, Tim. You're Well, what a visionary you are. That's rubbish. There isn't a school in this country that isn't full of eight to 12 year olds who could have invented the Eden Project. It's not very difficult. No, the, the genius, my genius, is that I realized that the secret was to see whether I could seduce people who only knew how to use the word no to say yes. And I discovered there are a number of techniques in this. The first is to mention people's tombstones. You just mention it gently in passing, their tombstone, and it would be nice, wouldn't it, if people visited your tomb and you'd done good things. And then you <laughs> and then you, you 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 slip into that mix, the thing which is utterly lethal you start talking about the beatles and you talk about the guy at decca records who didn't sign the beatles with the immortal words guitar bands will never catch on and then you look at people and say you don't want to be on the wrong side of history now do you and it's amazing how in a very short period of time a whole bunch of no's started to move from maybe into a yes and we raised we raised the money um and we were very popular. In fact, we, we decided to open uh, the year before we finally opened for an exhibition. We, there was such a lot of press about us. Um, we phrased it, yeah, we, we phrased it the eighth wonder of the world, right? And the media are so lazy 
that once you've decided to call it something, they just follow you. So, you know, the New York Times had it on its front page, the eighth wonder of the world is due to open next year and then pictures of it. Um, thanks, guys, that's really terrific. But in that year, <clears throat> we opened on March the 15th for five months, we had over half a million people came. And what did they want to do? They wanted to put on yellow jackets and they wanted a plastic crash hat. And if they were able to have tea out of a tin mug, that was so much the better. And if they could have a bacon sandwich as well, cool, blimey. We made a fortune out of people who wanted to buy the safety jackets. What they did with them when they got home, <laughs> Lord only knows. But it's very interesting. The reason it's interesting is that if ever you're doing a project, don't underestimate how much people like to see the adventures that other people are going on. Don't feel you have to just wait for it to be finished. It's actually the journey. In fact, if you go back to my story about the limousine, the truth of life for me, and I'm sure for many of you, it's the journey. The actual getting there, you'd end up, like Gertrude Stein once famously said, the trouble with getting there is that when you get there, there's no there there. And I think it's a, a tragic truth, actually. And that's why I called Eden a project. So it couldn't end. It's just up to me whether it's ended. That way I, I have the comfort that I can always change it because it's my story. Yeah. So anyway, Eden then opened and we had 1.8 million people, which was crazy coming through the door. Um, and we had to advertise to people to say, please don't come. Like crazy British. I mean, we actually put adverts in the major newspapers one day saying, when it's raining, please don't come. What happened? They all come. They want to know why they shouldn't have come when it's raining. It's just the British thing. So anyway, we've now settled down. We have about a million visitors a year. We, the thing about it is it cost 144 million to build, but we put about 2.5 billion back into the Cornish economy. What did we learn? Well, we learned from Ebu Vale. So if you're going to stock a shop with organic food, right? and you discover that Cornwall doesn't have a factory that is licensable to make organic food, pickles, and all the rest of it, do you buy it from somewhere else, or do you speak to the local enterprise partnership and say, can we find a company, train them how to do it, get the stuff, get the farmers to supply it, and then you're creating substance. So today, having done that, I'm very capitalist. I love building businesses that create general wealth, yeah? So the companies you may have heard of, Cholestic Ice Cream, Sharps Beer. Have you heard of Sharps Beer? They're huge now. They all came out working with us and, and, and doing their environmental testing on anything from their labeling to the uh, quality of their hops and stuff. And you feel a bit like a, an Old Testament prophet with the sort of standard you're trying to get to. But the thing is that once people buy into it and they make money, it's that old mafia saying, many of you would have seen the Godfather film, yeah? Godfather 1. There's a magnificent scene right at the end after the, with the gang warfare has come to an end and they come for a peace conference in Florida and they're going down, they're going down the moving staircase and they, this very old guy shuffles across the apron of the, the marble apron in front of them and Pacino says something like, I thought he was dead and the, his sidekick, his consigliere, he said, no, 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 everybody around him made money. And it's, it's true, it sounds filthy, but actually it's the truth. If you create a community and you create wealth for all the people around you in that community and you pay for training, you actually do the right thing, it pays you back. It really pays you back. So you can actually have the moral compass of being, if you like, a champion of social enterprise, but having a social enterprise does not mean you have to make a loss. I'm terrible, I, I have, I'm, I've got so many enemies. And one of the reasons I've got enemies is I hate a lot of NGOs. I hate the guys and gals who run NGOs and they look at you as if you should admire me because of the cause that I'm a champion of is marvellous. And you go, yeah, the cause is great. You're terrible. You couldn't hold a piss up in the brewery. Your charity should be really changing people's lives and you can't even add up. You see a lot of that in our country, by the way. That's why I don't have as many friends as I maybe like. But actually bearing in mind the book some... You know, I still got enough for hell and heaven. Um, so I got bored. Eden was doing really well. We persuaded AEG to enter a partnership with us. We've got the best outdoor music arena in the world. Pure accident. Um, 
the mine was carved with a perfect acoustic. Um, and so it's the only place Elton has ever played and allowed his live performance outside to direct to go broadcast. Loads of bands record their live and all the big bands want to play Eden because the acoustics are so good. So that was all going well. And we got approached whether we'd like to build another Eden in China. We went to China and it's 90% finished. It's been an absolute joy being with the British establishment with their knowledge of China, wishing to give you the benefit of their experience of ignorance and prejudice to tell you why you shouldn't work in China and why um, what is happening to the Uyghurs in the West is so bad that you should not go there. And then they get really upset with you and think you're treacherous when you say, well, didn't we also go into Iraq? You know, it's, just, it's really funny that the, the double standards. So we've been out there for four years. We love it. We absolutely love working there. And it is a bit alarming that you say you're going to do something and then three weeks later it's done. We signed our contract. Get this. They wanted to have a, a, a full signing with all the politicians we had at, at that time. As, as uh, Sajid Javid was the prime minister at that time. A full signing, right, in front of Chinese television. And they told us six months before it's going to be in the conference center. We went, what conference center? There wasn't the conference center. Six months later, there was the most amazing conference center finished. And we signed up in front of this building. It's terrific, absolutely terrific. So, you know, I, I, just to have a rant just for a moment. People tell you, what is the point of Britain pioneering things to deal with climate change when you've got countries like China poisoning the world? This is the, I'm quoting them, right? Or India. Well, China just happens to have put up more wind turbines over the last three years than the rest of the world put together, more solar. The subject I know a lot about is geothermal, more geothermal holes than anyone else, planted more trees. What is it about that kind of weird racism that suggests that a people with a huge burgeoning middle class that want to look after their kids and whatever, actually want to poison themselves to death. It's an actual weird contradiction. There are all sorts of bad things also going on. I'm not saying there aren't, but I just thought it's worth saying to audiences, you know, of, of a British background, to really protect yourself from the easy, lazy prejudice and do a bit of thinking in all of this, because it's so important. There is one area, if you disagree with someone about trade, if you disagree with someone about technology, if you worry about an arms race, the one thing which is safe territory for us to be friends about is the environment. And that's what we're doing uh, with our project in, in Qingdao. It's trivial. Of course, it's trivial. It's little old us doing something. But it's funny that in times of difficulty, the symbolism of people doing good things and respecting each other can often have a status that is way inflated above the actual thing itself. So we're building there. We're building in um, Morecambe. Morecambe, as you know, has had a harsh life um, from more recent problems with the um, cockle pickers drowning uh, to immense degradation of the, the landscape there and we got very interested we were asked by Lancaster University would we spend two days sketching up for a university course how the Eden Project might dream about a place like Morecambe to give it a chance I sent a team from Eden up there who got so obsessed by there they didn't come back for two weeks and then they produced this brilliant design which was given to the Vice Chancellor Lancaster, who sent it to the boss of the LEP, who sent it to the boss of Lancashire County Council, then Lancaster District Council, back to Morecambe Council. And literally in three weeks, from some fun of my team, the great team going to Morecambe, we had a situation where every organization in Lancashire had said, We want that. We want that. We believe in that. And what it is, it's basically imagine the biomes you've seen here. I don't know. I can't remember whether you've actually. Oh, there's the, it, there are some more can pictures out. Yeah. Okay, well, the, the, imagine four silver muscle, double-sided muscle shells. It's going to be four 
slightly random looking placed mussel shells on the beach. And what it's about is a rhythm of life. Um, it's about diurnal rhythm. It's about the tides. It's about what happens in our bodies at the same time. We're working with a whole bunch of people, Marshmallow, Laser Feast, you may have come across, they're the world's top augmented reality people. We're working with Apple. Um, and I think, I think it's going to be one of the most important buildings on earth. I really do. And that's not me being a marketeer. It is astonishing. The rhythms. Yeah, I am being a marketeer. But actually, the truth is. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And in it, you're going to be able to be in this room and hear the tide bringing. It's, it's an unbelievable tide. Don't you know, Morecambe? The speed of the tide is faster than a galloping horse. I mean, that is serious, serious speed. Lots of people have drowned there because of the um, uh, being caught out, but also all the creatures that come up and go down according to the thing. And then you look out over the Lake District. And if you just sit there patiently for an hour or so and you see these weather systems being created, so you've got the tide coming in and out, you've got the creatures coming up and down, you've got the weather systems being created, you've got, of course, the temporal things, the night and day. And when you get the sense of rhythms and everything, and then you get things about your body, how is it we thought it was hippie shit to think we might be influenced by the moon? I mean, you're looking at a bloody great lake, a, a, a bay that is going up and down every day, and you're 70% liquid, and you think you're not going to be influenced. So um, we're going to be sharing all of that. And then we're going to Dundee, where we're doing the same. Again, it's this exorcism thing. It's got the highest level of uh, deaths by drug overdoses of any city in Europe. Um, they thought that it was a really good idea uh, to build a very large housing estate next to a gas works, which is blocking off access to the river, which defines what Dundee is. So we're taking over the gas works and turning it into an incredible place. We created nine gills that have yet to be um, invented. They're, they're deliberately nine gills that do not exist. People of Dundee, over 35,000 people have joined guilds that don't exist yet. And every time we do a, a Zoom public meeting, thousands of people turn up. Every time we go up there, there's this hunger of people to belong, to do something, to um, be part of it. So we decided that the very first job we're going to do is not build anything to do with Eden. We're going to build a whacking great, beautiful bridge that will go from the estate behind the gas works across us and go over the dual carriageway and the railway line and go down to the river. For any of you who knows Dundee, it's a complete dog's dinner. They spent a fortune on the v and going up to Dundee, and they hired a fancy Japanese architect who wanted to be in all the architecture journeys, journals. There's no flat walls. Who that builds a museum without a flat wall? I mean, how... It's just great. It looks beautiful if it was an exhibit itself. But anyway, they need us to go there to create the critical mass that will make enough people want to be there. And it's really interesting. The, the council in D Dundee, if you want to be inspired, the, 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 the guy who's the uh, chief executive of the council in Dundee, he may well be the most charismatic guy I've ever met. He's a young man, your age, but what, 30, something like that. Every important meeting, get this, he invites the opposition leaders from each of the other parties. He says, I refuse to make a really important decision on behalf of our people without it being unanimously agreed. Because if I get elected out, I want to feel that what we're doing has got some longevity. And it's really, they're so respectful of each other. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. Every formal dinner they host, they're all guests so that they meet each other. Um, and so we're very lucky. You, as you know, the Beano comes from um, Dundee and the boss of the Beano, um, the, uh, the, the, the Thompson family, you know, uh, they made a huge donation to make this happen. Lovely, lovely people. Um, and also in, in Dundee is probably the best botanic research institution in the world that no one has ever heard of. It's amazing. I went in there. It's called the Sir James Hutton Institute. And if I say to you, please const constrain your excitement, okay? It's warm in here. 
but you could go wild when I tell you they have the biggest collection of potatoes outside Peru. Yeah, I could tell you'd be impressed. These are very cool people who are working in vert creating vertical farms, but not like hippie Chelsea kids. You know, this isn't like we grow some leaves, you know, some leaves, yeah, and we'll sponsor, you know, give, up, give a bit to Jamie. No, no, these guys are growing bulk vegetables. They're also growing bulk trees, but they're growing bulk trees with thought. They're growing bulk trees that are being injected with the mycelium that is right for those trees in the landscape of Dundee. This is science being applied to commerce, being applied to regeneration properly done. I've seen so many charities around the world saying, plant a tree in every bloody business in the world. Well, we'll plant some trees. And then they, they go around like the Virgin Mary. And then you go back a year later and almost all the trees are dead. Because you've got to manage these things. You've got to actually make the trees love where they're going. And to, the only way to do that is to make them feel as if they're of that place. This is science. And the really cool thing is it, it's science activism researching things that are real problem solving things so they're part of a community and there's a whole bunch of people who are not at the james hutton who are just citizens who are taking courses at the james hutton who are working as volunteers for the james hutton loads of big landowners nearby are now coming to treat get their trees treated in this way and that's how revolutions happen Part of the problem is that men fantasize about revolutions. The, the biggest cancer in our society is middle-aged men with fantasies, really. Because the, the truth is these revolutions that we need to have are like chain mail. They're like links that go together and become huge because everybody takes it over. Almost every, you know, you may really dislike my tone of voice about this, but so many of the charities I see working in the regenerative agriculture, the regenerative uh, you know, the so-called wilding environment, actually go into the whole thing with this kind of halo type thing going on and a very little understanding of the diversity, the understanding of the diversity that is required. And then if you add to that, you've got a government that is also fundamentally dull, where uh, honestly, honestly, I haven't yet met anyone on the front bench uh, that I'd give a job to. Really, I wouldn't. They don't understand science. They don't want to believe global warming really, but they know it's no longer fashionable to say they don't. So they say they do, but they don't understand that there are actually a few really brilliant things you could do as a nation. It's called the law, by the way. It's really interesting. Everybody is, they, we want a code of conduct. If you made it the law that you do this, this, and this, and if you don't, you have your head chopped off. It's amazing. Now I'm an old fashioned right winger, I'm joking. I'm joking, but the truth is the law could be so powerful. We work at Eden. We, we put quite a lot of money. We've raised money for um, uh, the, the Rivers Trust, um, and we sponsor a number of journalists to uncover what's going on within the water companies. Um, and that's a really interesting thing, too, <clears throat> because it's so cool to slag off the water companies. It's like, let's slag off the waste companies for the problems they have with our black bin bags. It's their problem, though, isn't it? And what's very interesting, a, a, a friend of many of the scientists in this department here, from Mike De Pledge, he 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 wrote a book which is about the thirty years of warnings that have been given to the government by scientists, explaining what's happening with microplastics, what's happening with it. It's a whole long list. It's not like no one knew, but no one listened to the Environment Agency. It's as if having a, having one is good enough. Yeah, that with the water quality thing, what is really interesting if you're being honest about it is you have the farming lobby have got a huge lot to answer for in terms of how they treat slurry and chickens and all the rest of it pharmaceutical industry has got a lot to answer for because of the fact they only test the poison elements of certain of their drugs against a few things rather than a cocktail of everything which is what they should do and so on and the planners insist that most stormwater is put into human sewage systems to clear it I mean, so when you get three or four lots of stupidity all compounding. No, the, the, I'm, I, the point I'm trying to make is being an activist can actually be kind of cheap because you get into kind of weird sloganing. 
actually solving some of these things requires an adult behavior to listening and seeing whether you can create some solutions by agreeing, which is something we're doing in Derby. We've got a big project in Derby. Anyway, I've probably come to the end of the, how long I should talk. So I want to talk about cow shit just quickly. No, no, because I want you to go home just really excited. Okay. Imagine... It's about the size of this room on the flat, yeah? It's full of the slurry of 187 cows. Yeah? It's big sludge. Across the top, of it, it's lined. The whole thing is lined, so it can't leach at all. On top of it is what looks like black parachute silk. Coming off this slurry, of course, is methane, which you all know is um, a gas which is variously between 15 and 20 times more bad for the environment than CO2. It doesn't really matter. We don't need to talk about that because I'm going to talk about it different. Um, this guy I know whose company 18 months ago was worth 40 pounds a share. His company today is worth 8,000 pounds a share. Has done something incredible. This parachute silk has two, can you imagine it's two parachutes with sort of like an air hole. Sucked into the middle air hole is hydrogen sulfide. You can tell me whether I've got the right one, but it, 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 pretend I'm right, okay? It's the one that does you in if you're a human being. And they suck that out, they pump it through um, carbon rods, charcoal rods, and sterilize the effect of that. Everything left under that parachute is now methane. It's compressed using a huge compressor powered by methane. And there's a giant generator outside and it's powered by methane. And this compressed methane, which goes into big cylinders, rides on the back of two tractors and occasionally on the front. It can work for six hours a day, but it could do more. With the gas, it's six hours a day, powered by the gas that's coming off the shit from 187 cows. The story gets even better, okay? <clears throat> this company have learned how to turn that gas into a liquid like petrol. They've also worked with the tractor company to make an engine with a filter that can filter the carbon out as the methane burns, yeah? You got it? So it's zero emission. New Holland, who are the company, a really big company, um, they're now changing all their engines because they see this is the future for the countryside. As you know, the average farm from the medieval period to today would have used 25% of its land mass to grow the crops that would feed the horses or the oxen, i.e. The, the machinery. Yeah? Today, most farms spend about 25% on their heavy equipment and the diesel they would put into it. But this is where it gets really sexy. So imagine you're using the waste to now create the energy, which means that at this stage, your energy cost in total is only 7%. The giant generator that is burning methane, but creating electricity, is doing everything to do with the farm and the milking parlor and everything else. By July, it's gonna be completely net zero, this farm. But the really cool thing is, every single liter of methane that is used to power the tractors and the combines, or to power the generator that creates the electricity, every liter, gets one liter equivalent of carbon offset tokens. How sexy is that? It actually means that you can start to explore a future for small farmers to actually have the ability to make money on their farm doing something that's good for the environment, good for us, and really good for them. And that's before you start looking at the biggest love of my life, which is circular systems. I am a capitalist and I believe 
that the only future for capitalism is to understand that the 40% or 37% of everything that we either mine or waste in food, we've got to stop wasting it. We've got to see that as being the area for growth. Yeah. So that the food, the waste of one thing becomes the food stuff of another. You with me? So go in the circle thing. So part of what I do is we've, we're building a circular system which is using hemp, it's using king prawns, and it's using mycelium. To say it is sexy it seems a bit odd, uh, bearing in mind what I'm talking about. But believe me, I am working with people to create a really exciting future. A really exciting. It's it's so thrilling to see the mycelium work going on. You know, I, um, I, I was I was talking to Yadvin earlier. Do you know what it feels like to be working on a research project with people who are working on fungi and that fungi, they think that they have managed to single out how that, that fungi can produce squalene. Squalene is a protein which is needed for the treatment of childhood epilepsy. And at the moment, it costs 120,000 sharks a year to get that amount of squalene. Just imagine you can grow it in a small rural location. Isn't that an exciting thing? Doesn't it speak to you about agency as opposed to the world, the damage of the world is being done to us. We've got no agency in it at all. It's screaming at you. Hang on, guys, there's a future to be made here. There's a really exciting future to be made. And just think all the things I already know, they're already foundation stones. What you already know, all of you already know is unbelievably valuable as the foundation stuff for the next bits you might like to know because you actually understand the language. You just may not have some facts. So I want to leave by just saying just this weekend, just look in the mirror and say, fuck. I know, don't say fuck. But, <laughs> but say, you know what? It might be just the coolest time ever to be alive. And we can do this stuff. We can prove that we're worthy of that name, Homo sapiens sapiens. So wise, we named ourselves twice. Okay. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. And I, I, I'm sorry I didn't talk science. <laughs> Wonderful, absolutely terrific. So we have we open up a few questions now before we go to drinks around the corner informally as well. So let's kick off, uh, Martha. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that in, in many ways. Um, I was one of the one million visitors to Eden Project earlier this year. And what really excited me was the way that people were connected with nature. Um, and I suppose I sort of expected to hear something about that today. And I don't mind not hearing about it because I feel what, really inspired. Me? Yeah, yeah. But I'm just interested um, in among the other um uh, things that make you tick that you're interested in, where where nature sits in that, because I know you've been talking about the circular economy and communities, and I'd be really interested to hear where you see people in nature sitting in your this projects. This is my sister, by the way, and she's <laughs> she's remembered that I haven't talked about something I care a lot about. Um, we do a lot with that. Uh, we do a lot of uh, nature connectedness. Um, in fact, we do. We've just got a huge grant for the next two years. To do it, we have uh, um, we have a sponsor whose brother committed suicide, uh, uh, and he wanted us to create a program. And he saw the programs that we've already got. We have a lot of people come uh, to grow things uh, in in cycles at at uh, uh, Eden, and it's really weird because they come and then we can only afford to have each group each one for one day a week, and they just get desperate because they want to be there every day. Why can't they be there every day? So we're working out a system about how the hell do you create a community where you have treatment, if that's the right way, therapy or something. Uh, the words are clumsy for me, I'm sorry. But they can then all volunteer to help the others on other days so it becomes a cycle. Um, and I'm really, really interested in it. I, th I think the whole issue of uh, nature connectedness, it runs the danger of feeling too glib because... You know, it, it, it's the same when you're in the business that I am of environmental awareness and all of that. If you hear the word center of excellence again, you feel like punching someone's lights out. If you feel that people are doing work that's leading edge, cutting edge, bleeding edge, ether thinking, thinking out of the box, thinking the unthinkable. Every time people to lose. Things. And the problem is that language, the language of nature connectedness is in danger of going into that area of, of a phrase that is almost being neutered by overuse. 
Um, there is an amazing book that has been written recently um, by the designer, a friend of mine called Thomas Heatherwick, that many of you may have heard of. He has built many famous things like the uh, the Olympic torch and stuff like that. He, he did the 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 the, uh, the pollen building at Shanghai Expo and all those things. And his book is called Humanize, and it's about um, connecting. Um, again, I, I, I have a learned new friend in the front row who knows all about this, but it's about human responses to man-made landscapes and cityscapes that have been thoughtlessly put together. You know, those, if you like, very assertive acts of testosterone architecture with reflective glass and hard edges and rectangles and squares, um, and showing that humans who actually come into presence, into the presence of that, their 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 neuro neurological responses are not dissimilar to having many um, unhappy thoughts. You know, I, I I I'm not technical, so I'm steering clear of the technicality. I'm absolutely riveted by it. I think community building, community making, is actually the next stage of where Eden should be. The problem is you get into a world in which money sounds as if however much money you've raised is a token of your intellectual ability. And in fact, many of the greatest in interventions you can ever make in life don't cost much. They're actually human time and thoughtfulness. Um, so I'm sorry I didn't mention it. I'm a big I'm a I'm a big fan of it. I'm really interested. I, I have, in fact, a lot of friends working in it. I've even got a friend working on the fringes of it with horses. And that's all uh, very strange. He, he had a very autistic son and he rode across Mongolia with him and affected huge change. There's, there's all sorts of stuff. You know, when I talking about hair at the start and we are starting, <laughs> there's all sorts of stuff in the areas of science, which are starting to become properly studied by people who know what they're talking about so that you can sort out the kind of romantic i want this to be true and i do believe in witchcraft and i do think lead can be turned into gold and yet right just just out of reach there's so much which is going to enable us to be well um if we can properly master the skills of understanding what are the triggers for that wellness and it's a subject that uh, uh, you will return to time and time again. And I think it's probably going to be something that informs professionally many of the people in this room, because notions like rewilding or the regeneration, whatever, they're all another form of exorcism. They're all another form of actually making good what humans think they've done bad. And then we find the science afterwards to justify it. But it, it, believe me, it start, always starts, all these things start with a kind of almost spiritual belief that something should be so and then they find the science that goes with it I, and I, I sorry I mean that not as a criticism I mean it as actually we are storytelling apes and we need to be able to tell a story that we can then persuade other people to get behind and then they recognize themselves in that story and sometimes meaning and truth aren't the same thing thank you uh, fantastic talk. So we live in this weird world where we have to ask for money on a regular basis. We don't get funded for long periods of time. And often the kind of innovation and novelty that you were talking about is devalued in peer review. So you didn't say much about money, but you've magically been able to kiss all these frogs and create beautiful amphibious pools and muscle shell things. Where where does the money come from? Well, I raise a lot of it. I terrorize people for it. I make people think they're going to go to heaven for it. <laughs> um, and it's all about storytelling. It's all about storytelling. How can you make the story you're telling feel muscular to the person listening how can it be made to feel like they're in at the start of something partially the trivial nature of academia and three year this and three year that um is i think god what a place for me to say all this i'm going to be probably killed before we have a drink i think academia has an awful lot to answer for because it has mistaken its role in life most universities are no longer actually universities they're corporates 
and they <laughs> they see their students as the cannon fodder and the really smart people who've got a job there are just hoping that the students will fuck off and they can actually research what they want to do <laughs> and that is the truth <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lindsay, I knew you were in the room. Um, 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 it is true, though. What is true is, um, and I tell this story at my, at my own expense, is I was for three years, um, I was a trustee at the Wellcome Trust. And I have to say, I was, I was asked to go there as a critical friend. And they weren't used to the level of criticism. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. I mean, I have to say, the process of peer review, where the people who peer review you are the people that you are going to then peer review at some later point, leads to a corruption at the heart of a system where the sort of thing which should be being researched, people are too. I, this it's a generalism that does not count for everybody. Please, uh, it's to do though. There is a certain type of person in any profession, and there's usually quite a lot of them, who feel that by keeping their head down and just doing something by the book, they will have a nice career. I went to the launch of the Pasteur Institute um, presence in Britain. Their chief executive was ruthless. I mean, it. he looked like a rock star anyway, but he got on the stage with all these funders and he said, you could waste your money and give your money to some of these big foundations um, with their pinkies in the air and their champagne, or you could invest in Pasteur. So I would tell you, we, many of our scientists, they get Nobel prizes. Do you know why? Because they're curious. They want to solve the great problems in society. Most of the, most of the others, they want just grants. If you want to be involved with people who just have grants, fine, don't come to us. You just really put, people were just fighting to put money into the Pasteur up. <laughs> It's a hell of a thing. It's a bit like, um, uh, what's he called? Norman Foster, when he went to pitch for the British gas building. A friend of mine was there when he did it. All these other architects had spent an hour each telling why they should, they should do it. He walks in and he says, you know my work. I'm very good. Um, <laughs> let's just keep it short. And he had this Japanese lady with him. And he said she unwound this sketch, which was almost illegible. Right. The sun comes from there. It will reflect like that. The image will be like this. Your brand will look absolutely electric. It will look like a blue flame at the top of it. You know where I live. Six million is my price to do the job. Good day. <laughs> and get this. The judging panel, who was supposed to be all cool, just applauded him. And he got the gig. There is a there is a funny thing. If I was to swallow my words so I don't upset my dear friend in the back there about yeah. research, there is something ill at the core of all academia in the way that we have somehow taken well, by academia I, I actually mean not purely academia it's it's like civic society as a whole has had its sense of meaning and belonging taken away from it it's been infantilized so we expect somebody else to always do something and part of all of these conversations is about at what point do we suddenly realize we could take some agency we can do things and then institutions respond to it. So your question was about money. I get money by talking to people. I talk to people a lot and I say, you've got money, give it to me. <laughs> no, I, no, but it's, it's really, people are, in Britain, people just don't know how to talk about money. I mean, they're, it, it's excruciating. You should watch an English person ask for money is actually, you actually feel like you want to cry because it's it's like <laughs> could you <laughs> no. um i think you've got to be really quiet okay. say it's knowing what you study um i think there is a narrative that one can use with people about do you care about your fellow citizens do you think these are serious propositions you have money i have not but i've got genius and you don't why don't you give me some money i hire you <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, we should take one more. Anyone on the back for a question? Yeah, I've got the hand up there. That's for the audience. Audience. This is such a dangerous role for me. I'm in the way of you in a drink. Jesus. I'd have walked out by now. <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed by your courtesy. Um, the, there's a there's a one of those pictures is a, a picture of before the Eden project was built um and for a mining company it's mined out it's not worth any money 
it would be seen as a liability. So presumably the mining company that you bought it off was sitting with a major liability to rehabilitate that. So I guess a simple question is how much did you buy um, that land for? Well, that is an incredibly astute question because you might say that it is obviously worked out. There's a tradition in the mining industry that no mining company is allowed to admit they've worked out a mine. They are always just resting until the price changes or else you're quite right, or else there would be all sorts of remediation clauses that would force them to remediate that. In truth, this was an incredibly annoying project because the clay from this pit uh, is, is, is called, it's called a teaspoon pit because the clay was very valuable. Um, in fact, it was the pink colored clay that went to uh, the making of the Financial Times. Um, and every time we did a borehole before we bought it, they were standing on the cliffs with binoculars looking at the cores coming out. <laughs> we would then come back, you know, the next week to do another core and the whole of the foundation thing had been dug out. And this went on for six months. The architects were thinking of giving up until the youngest architect was at home doing the washing up. And he sat down and he looked at the um, washing up lying in its, uh, uh, in, it, in its mantle and saw all these soap bubbles. And he went, that is the design. It's the honest truth. That's how we came up with the design for the hexagon shapes, because you can actually, it doesn't matter what the foundation does, it will always uh, fit. Yeah, so that's how that happened. But the other thing about the clay pit is, is that the deal they had is that they could only sell a clay pit if their opponents, the other, the competition, signed formal letters to say they had permission to sell it. And that had never, ever happened. And because the implication would be that once anybody admitted that one of the pits was worked out, English China clays, which is worth X hundreds of millions, could be seen as being massively in debt. You see what I mean? In terms of its stock valuation, it could have been ruinous. So it's a brilliant question you've asked. We paid four million pounds for that pay pit. We paid two million and they then lent us two million to make four million so that we could start digging. And then we paid them the extra two million after we opened. But we weren't going to get an agreement. A, we weren't going to have a project unless we had a pit. We weren't going to get an agreement with everybody signing unless everybody could see honor was satisfied and we weren't we weren't sterilizing a derelict we weren't taking a derelict pit we were taking a pit that was resting that's how it works that was the real politique and at the same time we had to persuade the county council that they would never see the deal that we had done as setting any precedent for the council to go after either mining company and they they had it witnessed by lawyers and signed that was how complicated it was. You're aghast. It was well, just think how I felt. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay, well, I'll ask uh, just one question, uh, the final book. On, uh, so many people here, a lot of students, so they're very concerned about state of nature, protecting it, restoring it. A lot of issues around grief, around the climate change and the state mm. of biodiversity. Finding solutions seems complicated, tangled, multi-scale, challenging. What would be your final succinct words of advice? Because you've got, you've got wine around the corner. But what would be your final words of advice for somebody wanting to make a difference uh, in, in their lives and contributing to the challenges we face? Well, I don't know how much you know about English history, but almost everybody owns a lot of land, used to beat up people, and that's how they got a lot of land. I, I genuinely believe that we ought to put pressure on the government and the National Lottery, who I've spoken to privately about this, and have a revolution in land ownership in our country. Um, I think um, I think there's a very strong case. I know so many young people, by young I mean your age, who've actually are looking at farming, horticulture and things like that. 
as being a modern thing they'd like to do. And they actually want to do it in a way of land owning ownership, which is not my generation stuff. There's a lot of cooperative thinking that they'd like to do and so on. It is also true that so many of the things which could make the management of land both profitable and really good for the environment are stopped because the capital is not available to people. So, for example, if you wanted to grow hemp, the, there is only one factory in the whole of Britain that can ret hemp and create, if you like, wooden fibre from the cotton that is the central hard bit of hemp and so on. And we need to have a new finance structure for the, for the countryside for which uh, nature net uh, deficit payments and uh, whatever is a kind of urban thing. It's a bit like the Chelsea boys growing basil in their underground stations and calling it the new agriculture. I think it needs to be proper. I think we need to get, get land into the hands of young people all over the country. I think big landowners, but well, we can no longer go and beat them up. OK, we can't go and beat them up. Um, but we can create a law in which they cannot be disbenefited through giving up their land, but it land then becomes into popular thing. I think you'd see a real revolution in our country if you made land available. Um, and they're hungry to do stuff. And if every if you make if you're made to feel like a stranger in your own strange land because others have, have, have kind of dominated it, that's not a great thing for our democracy. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that was we could say that was pretty unique. So <laughs> we all learned a lot from that. Thank you. Uh, so it's uh, wine time. It's wine time. It's just around the corner. Feel free to join us uh, for, for a drink. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry it was a bit of a narrative arc, but. <laughs>